Welcome everybody to That Poker Podcast, episode 99. It is April 18th, 2021. I'm your host, A. Schwartz, alongside Roscoe P. Coltrane. Hey, you guys. You guys, you guys. Uh, and uh, Terrence Chan in uh, up, uh, up Province, BC. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm doing well up Province, BC. I was uh, in another part of the province earlier this week. Lost my water for a week thanks to the neighbors uh, cutting cutting my water line. So I've I went to Radium Hot Springs, British Columbia, for a, a nice ah. COVID destination. Radium's nice. Uh, and uh, Daniel Legrenu in Las Vegas with this uh, snappy new hoodie on there. Got this. Yeah, the Dead Mouse hoodie in honor of the Spring Festival happening at GG right now with all these crazy guarantees. And I'm stuck here in Las Vegas, not in Cabo, playing them. Maybe I should have went. Who knows? But, you know, I wanted to handle the vaccine thing. We're double vaccinated, feeling good. Uh, so excited. We almost, I almost went to my first dinner in 16 months last night. The wife you almost went? Yeah, we were going to go. We had plans, and then she just wasn't feeling so good. So we're probably going to do it next week. It'll be a cele- celebration of, like, you know, 16 months of quarantine, and then we're going to eat out. When, uh, you know, that should be fun. Because I don't really do anything. You know, we just stay home, but I love it. What is the first live poker tournament that you would think that you would play? Oh, I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play. In fact, um, we're all going to be tested for this, but I will be playing Poker After Dark this week. Um, I was asked to play in several of the shows, and I was like, listen, I, I don't go to the house that much, so, like, Cut, cut the number in half and give me some time to breathe in between. So I'll be playing a few of those, probably playing with, uh, hopefully, you know, Paul Pierce, free Paul Pierce, free him from ESPN and Disney and some others in some big high stakes game and uh, maybe some sit and goes, Phil Helmley should be there. And then of course I've got my match against him, but I'm looking forward to a schedule of live events that will be released, I think rather soon that are high stakes that I'm super, that here in Las Vegas and I'm, Super excited to, to get back to it, honestly. What, to, what did Paul Pierce do to get fired? I missed it. I know he got fired, but what so did he say? Here's what happened. Okay, so he likes to have alcohol. He was playing in a private poker game, and he likes to smoke weed, and he likes the company of women that are scantily clad. So he was all, on Instagram all Live. Everything's legal, right? Everything's legal uh, so far. Everything's everything legal. He did, yeah, everything legal so far. And he was just wasted out of his mind on Instagram talking shit, and then there was, like, girls banging, bouncing around like this, and, you know, they didn't, they weren't naked. They were just there. He's like, oh yeah, check that out. Whatever, like this. And of course, you know, ESPN is owned by Disney, right? So that, you know, like they're a lot more like careful with their branding and their image and stuff like that. And it didn't really, really vibe. So, you know, they have every right to fire him. He seemed good with it. He's like, I get it. You know, they're, he said, he literally said in the video, he's like, they're going to fire me for this shit. <laughs> the very next day. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> the very next day. He was oh, that's pretty it. mild. I mean, I was expecting uh, yeah. much, much worse than that, actually. Well, I'm telling you that, well, ESPN, right? Like, I, I thought I told you guys this before once, but like, I was on the break desk once with Helmut for the main event. And I literally said the following I was like, it's not like this guy sucks, right? I was talking about a player. I mean, it's like, it's not like he sucks. It's not like he's going to go all in here, right? The next day, I was reprimanded by the executive saying, you know, please refrain from using the term sucks. And I was like, what? Why? What's wrong with sucks? And then I'm like, okay, what is it? So then I thought back to like the origin of sucks, right? And I guess sucks, the origin of it was sucks dick or whatever, right? So now, but I mean, like, I, I just felt like sucks is a term that has joined the English vernacular that doesn't have that same root meaning for 99.99% of people. So I found that to be really nitpicky. And I was like, all right, I won't, I'll try not to say it, but geez, it's like, I say sucks all the time. Like this guy sucks. I suck. You know, it's, it's never, I never made the connection to actually putting a penis in, in your mouth and doing fellatio. It's just weird how we've gotten to this point, right? Like, you know, I'm, I understand everybody's talking about cancel culture and, and all that kind of stuff, but, but this is in, you know, like, like you said, they have their own, they have the ability to do it. It's well within their right to do it. They're, he's an employee of them and he doesn't align with, that doesn't align with their values or what he did, but really like, it, or should we be thinking about what the values are here? Because that doesn't really, that doesn't, uh, you know, do anything but alienate some people. Right. What's that? Like firing him? Well, firing him. Yeah. So firing him, you know, he's got more fan. Let's put it this way. He, Paul Pierce has more fans than people that will be alienated by the fact that he had a girl or two standing behind him. Well, what, interestingly enough, and I'm sure that some of the people that hate them, the first thing I saw on Twitter was, you know, Dave Portnoy, the very humble gentleman from Barstool Sports. Yeah. He literally, you know, tech tweeted at Paul Pierce and said, call me. Like, it's not like Paul Pierce isn't going to be in demand. So yeah. I had this discussion yesterday with my assistant on this topic of cancel culture that you said, and you know, he doesn't believe it exists at all. And 
I was trying to say, like, I think he's defining it differently than I am, right? So for, in his, I think the way he defines it is the idea that these people are canceled as a result of, you know, mob mentality. It's like, not really, because these are usually wealthy celebrities who are going to be just fine. And they're going to get other jobs like Sharon Osbourne and the like, right? So in, in that sense, I think that he's probably on the right track. However, you know, when I think of cancel culture, I think of the word culture. And it's a culture of people who today in our society, as opposed to 10 years ago, you know, as a group, you know, are, like have a goal of having this person lose their job or, you know, to cancel them, if you will. And like, I think it's impossible to deny that that's grown with social media, you know, on both sides, right? You have Donald Trump trying to cancel Coca-Cola and Delta. And then you have, you know, other people trying to be canceled for jokes that are, you know, inappropriate or whatever. So it's a thing. Now, again, is it effective? Does it really end in a result that like a person is canceled? No, I don't think so. Louis CK can still do comedy and stand up and whatever. He's not, you know, destroyed, but the process or the goal of canceling is real as far as I'm concerned. I can't imagine, you know, that's not a thing. Yeah, I think, um, I think you touch on a couple interesting points there, which is that people have always really enjoyed sort of watching people in high places fall, um, you know, celebrities, wealthy, whoever it is. And that's always existed long before social media. So even when I was a kid, there was supermarket tabloids that told you about all the scandals that Hollywood celebrities or CEOs or politicians or whoever it is did. And it was always an attempt to bring those people down. And you could, you always said, now the, what, what's changed with social media is, is you have the ability to directly contact that person. You have, a, you have an outlet by which many people can follow you and you can make your voices heard of them before you had to like work for a newspaper or like actually be somebody in, in journalism or media or something like that to actually properly have a voice. So you've sort of democratized the ability to knock people down a notch. And, and people really like knocking people down a notch. Yeah. It, it, it helps people find some fulfillment in their otherwise little meaningless lives. And here's the thing. Some people deserve it. Like there are some oh, people yeah. who absolutely deserve it. And, and this gets washed in with people who don't deserve it. As that's, the, that's the biggest problem, I think, Adam. I think you're absolutely right. I think there are extreme versions where somebody should absolutely be fired, canceled, whatever you want to you know, say. But the problem is when you start to like, you know, get people for things they said 15 years ago, or like Kevin Hart who made a, you know, insensitive homophobic joke, but 15 years ago, and now there's, you know, there's a push to have him removed from, you know, this and that. It's like, we all evolve, we all change, we all make mistakes, as long as people are willing to like, apologize for it, you know, we should be able to move forward. But you're right, like when you lump in minor transgressions with serious offenses, then it all just sounds like noise to people. And they just, yeah. they, they no longer distinguish the difference, right? I think that's really rough. The stuff from many years ago, I think there was that, I don't remember which magazine, one of those popular teen magazines, the editor was fired because comments she made when she was 17 on Twitter. Yep. She it was, was just, it just so happens that she's like in her early 20s. Like if you, if, if, if I were 15 years younger and you could pull up shit that I said on Twitter when I was 15, holy, I would be canceled so but fucking What's hard. interesting about her is she, and listen, she wasn't fired. She chose to resign, which people like to point out, but she was heavily pressured by her peers. And this is a, black person of color. She is a woman who's about 27 and in high school tweeted something like, that's so gay. Or, and, and, and one other thing that was, you know, homophobic and she apologized for it, acknowledged it, said she's, you know, learned since then or whatever. But, you know, ultimately her peers in, you know, at Teen Vogue were like, nope, we want her out, which that yeah. is problematic. Yeah, you have to you have to judge things against context in which they exist. Like when I was in high school, you could call people all manner of homophobic slur and it was like accepted. And, it, and it's terrible what we did. Like, but, but like, if, if you dig up that stuff and say like, oh, Terrence is an awful person because he said that in high school. It's like, uh, it's a little, uh, you know, it's questionable. I mean, it's the world so much changed. I, I was talking to Jared Ankerman about this stuff. Barack Obama in 2008 was against gay marriage. Like, think a lot, like, think how long we, like how far we've come. That was not letting go. For Barack Obama's first two term, he was against gay marriage. Like now it was not even On that note, my wife and I, because this was her favorite show, we just watched Californication, which is only like, you know, five, six years old or something like that. And I cringe because they like he, they use the word retard so often. Right. And I'm like, ugh, cringe. Like I cringe now. But that was just basically that was just in the normal vernacular until, you know, we decided it was no longer something that we wanted to use as a phrase. But it's like that was only five, six years ago, to your point, you know, that Obama, like you said, in 2008, who was this progressive, you know, candidate or whatever, like stood against what the vast majority of Americans and people across the world are for today. Uh, all right. That's the <laughs> cancel culture portion of our yeah. poker podcast. Uh, we'll get that out of the way. That's the first uh, part. It's the first cancel culture. 
<laughs> oh, there's more coming. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple things interesting happened this week. You know, there's some poker stuff and we'll get to it, but there's also some other interesting stuff out there. Um, and uh, one of the things was um, there was a YouTuber, Aaron Paul, who uh, got in the, uh, in an MMA octagon with an actual <laughs> MMA fighter, a boxer, a boxing, you got in a boxing ring with it. Yeah. Uh, sorry. And, you got in a boxing ring and decided to, um, to fight, uh, you know, a real trained professional. And, you know, Aaron Paul, or it's Aaron Paul? <laughs> it's Jake, Jake, Jake Paul. Paul. Jake Paul. Has he got a brother? No, Aaron Paul's the <laughs> great <laughs> bad guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jake Paul, I'll, I'll get it right. Um, he was a favorite. And and I'm texting T before. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? This guy's a favorite. He's like a YouTuber. And should I be betting the dog here in this spot? And and you're like, uh, well, I'm just kind of staying away from him. I was like, just, I can believe it. Like, yeah. T, what happened? Ben Askren was an Olympic wrestler. He was a, he had a very successful MMA career because he was very good at taking people down and scrambling them and holding them down and beating them up as he did so. Um, nowhere in his MMA career did he really develop the ability to, to punch and kick effectively. You know, that's, that's something that you tend to think of as an attribute in professional fighting. <laughs> um, and that's probably where you were going with this. Um, the thing is, he, he would punch and kick just well enough to set up his offense, right? So, I mean, like, you know, there's many ways to crack the nut of MMA. That's the way he chose to do it. He would, you know, feint punches, feint kicks, do some weird spinning thing just to be able to get a hold of guys and scramble. I mean, if people remember Ronda Rousey, this was very similar to the way she fought too. She was a beast on the ground and not very good standing up. So uh, Jake Paul is, yeah, he's a YouTuber, but I think he has been training boxing since he was probably a teenager. I think he's, I don't know, 24, 25 now. Um, took the sport seriously, like during his younger years, like when Ben Askren was wrestling, you know, like, I mean, I mean, if this was a, you know, 25 year old Ben Askren was wrestling all the time, wrestling, 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 wrestling. And he's a great a athlete in the sport of wrestling, but he never really learned to box. Jake Paul uh, was the guy, who, you know, he learned to box. I mean, is he a great athlete? Probably not, probably not Olympic level athlete, but he took it seriously. He has enough money to fund the coaching. Um, so that's why he was a favorite going in, and that's why he ultimately did win. Ben Askren also retired from MMA about two years ago because he had his hips stopped working. He needed a hip replacement surgery. Um, so, you know, that was his whole thing. So you have this setup, which is, which is perfect for a guy like Jake Paul. I'm going to beat a guy who was in the UFC, and he was a champion of multiple MMA organizations, and that will legitimize you. you but you basically couldn't pick a better scenario. It's like... It's, it's like, uh, you know, hockey guys, there's probably a better, better sports scenario, but imagine you decided you really wanted to beat Dana Merzen in a breakaway contest. If you were like 18 years old, skates? hang on, where are my skates They're around here? Somewhere. If you were like 18 years, you're not even skate, you're like 18 years old and you're just going to be like, I'm going to be, I'm going to train on breakaways and nobody's going to know. I'm not going to be like an elite level hockey player. But I'm going to train breakaways, and I'm going to beat Dana Merzen at breakaway. You know, like you know, like like a penalty shots or breakaways or whatever, like on two on one breaks. I'm like, that's okay. the sort of scenario we're facing. Uh, but yeah, we were. I mean, most of MMA people, I think, were cheering for Ben Askren. I guess because it's like it's embarrassing to have like a guy from quote unquote your sport lose to a professional YouTuber. But like, <laughs> I bet on Jake Paul. <laughs> I mean, like, because I, I don't know, it's just like Ben Askren's always been really bad at striking. You just sort of see this in every one of his fights. And then you add on top of that, like a hip replacement uh, at the age of 39 or whatever it is. It's like it didn't spell recipe for success. I did not think he was going to get knocked out in the first round. Um, yeah. I actually thought that I bet the over. Um, I was wrong on that. I had like over five and a half rounds. I thought Ben Askren's a really tough guy. He's been hit by really hard dudes in the past and not gone down. I mean, he went down, but he got, he beat the count, but he was like out on his feet. So that part of it surprised me. It seems like Jake Paul has some power. Good for him. I mean, you guys know me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy who took up MMA after a poker career. Like it wasn't my first career. So like, I, I like people getting into fight sports. Jake Paul seems like kind of a jerk, but I mean, I like to see how far amateurs can go in combat sports. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay, a couple of things. First, how many? Let, let's say the thirty thousand people that are going to watch this know who who Dana Merzen is. Like, what what's the total there? Not as many as know who Jake Paul is now, I guess. Probably, probably not. Paul. I don't. I don't know. There was. What, give me a modern. Uh, give me a football or a 
I don't know. Basketball. I, do well, I, think they, I think they get, they figure out. But my favorite part of this was when they asked uh, Oscar. Well, it's like being Shaq in the three point contest, uh, right? Yeah, three point. Actually, you, Shaq's not bad at threes. I've, I've seen okay. some videos. Oh, but free throws, free throws. Yeah, beating Shaq in a free throw contest. Like yeah. Timex would beat Shaq in a free throw. Timex would crush him. Isn't Absolutely. that weird? Like, it's not a what a weird world, but they're both technically basketball. <laughs> well, when they asked Askren after the fight, um, you know, they, is it going to be embarrassing? And he goes, yeah, it's going to be absolutely embarrassing. And then I'm thinking to myself, what about the people who lost to Ben Askren? Who, they lost to a guy who lost to a YouTuber. Like, isn't it worse for them? Well, they all got fucked on the ground. Nobody nobody got lost to Ben Askren because, like, he straight out unboxed them. They're, oh, they're, yeah, yeah. That, that guy doesn't exist. Everybody who ever lost to Ben Askren got put on their butt and beat up. Um, on their but back. Ben was before this. His his. I mean, the, his last most famous moment was ha- like the most vicious UFC knockout of all time. Yeah. It's so in, yeah, you got his the the four second KO. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, all right, another thing that happened this week. Uh, I think I mentioned it a few times on the podcast. Uh, there was thirty six of us in a weight loss challenge, uh, poker players and poker media types, um, and it was a six month challenge to lose ten percent of your body weight. Uh, you had to make uh, you know monthly weigh ins and. Um, make your marks and everything and then um, at the end there was a there's a weigh in and there was a penalty for it was five hundred dollars for every pound that you came in over your goal weight Um, and so there's 36 of us Uh, I want you guys to guess how many of the 36 you think made it so Ross why don't you go first so 10 percent of their body they had to lose 10 percent of their body weight there's 10 percent of their body weight how how many do you think Ross did not make it given the penalties involved um I feel like that's not that hard. I would say 20%. 20%. So 20% you, of the 36. What is it? You're going to make us do math. So that's 7.2. Uh, <laughs> 7.2. Ross. Uh, okay. Uh, Daniel, how many do you think made it, made it? I would say, I mean, listen, what, 10% of your body weight and you're all probably kind of fat, right? <laughs> like, I mean, well, you wouldn't be doing this if you weren't kind of fat, right? So yeah. Like, I'm not going out are, there trying to lose 10%. Well, that's relevant of because for Terrence to lose like 10% of his body weight, Yep. It would be a lot more difficult than, you know, somebody who's kind of fat. So 10% can't be that much. Just, you know, put the soda down. I would say only two did not. Two, two out of three. Okay. Uh, Terrence? I'll, I'll split the middle. I'll say it was like four. Ross is dead on. It was seven people of the 36 to Yeah, eight. exactly. A couple of guys weighed Quick more math than in my head. Started. I knew 20% just felt right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and a couple, of the, <laughs> a couple weighed more than they started, which was like. Bravo. Okay. But, yeah. You're going to commit <laughs> to it? Just uh, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yolo uh terrence did you get a bunch of texts on how i, I did i was just wondering i, I was like because i didn't know it was 36 people i was like oh this makes no more sense like why is my where where multiple people dm me damning me about weight cutting advice uh <laughs> it was just, yeah i knew about this but i did have a thought on it though it, it's interesting i didn't know the exact terms i'm just like i'm helping people cut weight they ask yeah. questions i answer them it's fine um i don't mind but i, I was trying to think of like a, a sort of a better way to do this because i'm thinking presumably everybody did this because they they kind of you know want to lose some weight and they kind of want to do it long term i don't know if going forward weight loss bets are, are really the way to do it or at least not in the way they're like first of all anytime you have like an extrinsic motivation for something that like if you really want to do something and you want to make it like a life goal which is like be healthy or stay at a healthy weight I think like the extrinsic motivation or whether it's money or whether it's like, Oh, I want to, I want a girlfriend, you know, so I want to look better. or I want to look good in my Instagram photos. Like I, I think those tend not to work as well as just like the intrinsic intrinsic motivation of trying to look good. But putting that aside, people really like bets. Um, so I was trying to think of a way to make the bets better, which is the only thing I can think to do is to make it the only way that you can create a bet where people won't gain the weight back after the bets complete and especially if they know that there's potentially another weight loss bet six months down the road that they can get fat for. Um, who would that be? I don't know. Like have it for like a really talking. long period. Like, yeah, you bring up a good point, Terrence. Just quickly, I want to interject. Yeah. And say like, you're absolutely right. Because like, let's say you have six months to do this bet and two weeks out, you're not going to do it. You call Terrence and you go, what do I do with this water weight thing and sauna and no eat salt for two weeks? And it's like, you know, eliminate all the water weight that you have in your body just so you win the bet. And then the very next day, you gain back like 15 pounds. Like, if yeah. the goal is altruistic where everyone's there to like, you know, help each other out doing it that way is like, okay, I did it, but did I really, you know? Yeah. I mean, I could, I could lose 10% of my weight tomorrow. I really could. It wouldn't be healthy at all. It wouldn't be good. I shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. 
but I could if I had enough money. If somebody were to, Daniel, you were to put up like a half a million tomorrow, I'm fucking, I'm making that weight like 100%. But it's not good for you. You, didn't, you shouldn't want to do it. So I think the only way to do this, if you're going to do it in the context of, a, of a, a weight loss bet, is to have like a really long timeline and not make it set to a certain date. I think you have to like randomize dates, do, do like a random weigh in every three months. Like maybe you do it with a buddy, right? So like Adam, you find somebody else in the group. And then you find somebody, Ross, who says like, he's going to just spin a wheel. And on this day, you guys both have to weigh in. Whoever doesn't make weight or makes weight worse owes the other guy this many dollars. this many. And then you guys don't know when the next one is. Because if you're cutting weight for a certain event, it's just too easy to game the system. And then you have that go on for like five years yeah. uh, or, or something like that. And then hopefully after the five years, like you've developed all these habits. You're like, oh, I feel good. My, my doctor said I'm going to live longer. Like I've got more energy, all this kind of stuff. Like I like the way I look. All this extra stuff does, does better. Because I think the way that weight loss bets are set up now, like you know this with the Perkins bet is like you killed yourself to, to, to win the 25K from Perkins, obviously, because you were can sufficiently motivated to do that. But then, you know, slowly over time, you put that weight back on. What if? instead of giving you 25K up front to make weight eight times in eight weeks, what if he gave you like a thousand dollars every time he could call you on the phone and say, you're, if you're under whatever you want to be, 185 pounds, if you're under 185 pounds right now and you can get to the scale right now, we'll give you a thousand dollars. Well, you're probably going to stay under 185 pounds for most of that period. Or if, or if I'm over, I have to pay. Yeah, exactly. So, I, so right, like, Terrence, like, I, there's another way I thought of just too real quickly that let's say, for example, if the goal was to lose about 20 pounds over 20 weeks, you could do like a weekly weigh in, right? And you know, you basically have to be on track every week or pretty close to on track. Yeah. Or you know, you have to be like, all right, he's down one, he's down three pounds after three weeks. After week four, he was off. Um, obviously, that could be, you wouldn't want to make penalties too severe for that because water weight and different things can affect your. Uh, the problem is that at what happens after the 20 weeks, right? Like, I'm, 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 I'm sure you can do that. Lower though, right? But like, if you lose it at a slower progression, yeah. like you're, you're less likely to just boom, put it all back. Like, you know, true. I mean, it's hard. Like, I, I think Adam did was super disciplined for, I don't remember how long the Perkins bet was, but it was sort of a period of time that looked like that. And yeah. it's just really hard to rely on discipline forever because when you're like done, it feels like this weight's lifted off your shoulder. Oh man, I am going to fucking go out and eat all the burgers and all the pizza now and all the ice cream. Right. Like, cause it's just like, it, that's, that's kind of what you feel like you want to do. And even if you don't do it like the day after your weigh in, you know, you, you're, you're sort of like two weeks later, you're at, you're out with some friends and be like, Oh, why not? Why won't I have the ice cream? Right. It's, it's... The other one I remember the other way to do it. And I, th- I was talking to Huck like uh, forever ago, years and years and years ago. And he had a bet. I think it was with Helmuth where Helmuth could call him up at any point. And I think he had a number of set number of hours to get to a scale and he couldn't be over. I think it was one ninety or something. He'd remember. I but it's perfect. Yeah. I, I think that was it. Like, okay, you've, you know, Helmuth call him up and, and if, cause I think, I think what happened was Helmuth prepaid or there was something, but that was, that's the way to do it. Right. There's, so there's no set uh, date, like you said, but it, maintaining it all the time. Yeah. I think that's a right yeah. idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I'm glad there's like, it's always when there's a weight loss thing, it's always nice when there's a camaraderie, like 36 of you guys, I'm sure you had like a chat group and everything yeah. like that going on. So I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of positive things came out of it. I'm always thinking about ways to sort of hack people's uh, health in that in that way but but do it in a way that's like long-term and sustainable daniel you're uh you you cut like you had a big cut go and then you were putting on some weight where uh, what's the goal now what where are you at i did uh so like i cut for like seven months or, or wait no no I, I cut for like almost a year and i bul- uh, i was bulking for like seven months i did i just finished like a four-week cut uh so now i'm back to like you know looking to gain about two to two and a half like two and a half pounds to three pounds a month for the next probably three, four months. And then, you know, we'll just see what the fat looks like. And then, you know, probably do another mini cut for two to four weeks, a little bit more aggressively looking to, because t- typically when I was cutting, like the goal was just to lose like one to one and a half pounds a week tops, not more than that, just slow, steady progression. Um, but now with these mini cuts, looking to cut probably double that, you know, per week and just do it for a short period of time. And the goal, I guess, is to like maintain the muscle, just cut away the fat and then continue to add. So I'm like 150. 455 pounds now ultimate goal is to be like 160 165 but you know like with a, you know like a good you know like just basically with a good body composition because i can get to 165 no problem if i want to you know what i mean <laughs> it's just like you know but i just want to continue to add some muscle it'll take probably about another year i think before i'm where i want to be and t what are you doing what are you uh you got dad bod going on 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, everybody's got a little, right? I mean, you know, the wrong side of 40 and all that. No, I mean, I, I basically, throughout COVID, I, I basically, like, because I'm not a guy who will, I'm, I'm not going to go off on the junk food. So I'm not, there's no worries that I'm going to get like, you know, fat and really go off the rails. So I've definitely relaxed my, like my, my diet, you know, I'm a little more casual since I quit fighting because now I don't have to make weight. I used to have to make weight all the time for fights. So now I've been to do that. Now I just want to like be strong enough to do all the things that I want to do, which is mostly these days, like jujitsu, um, you know, jujitsu is a rough sport. Um, it's hard on the bone, jo- on the joints, Ugh, joints and bones even. And so mostly I just, since COVID, just lifting weights in the garage, lifting heavy, but I don't, I don't try to actively gain weight. Um, you know, cause I, cause I just don't enjoy like eating like more the way, if you're, if you're kind of a, a naturally slender build like me, the only way you can actually gain weight is to eat more than you really want to. And, and Daniel will attest to this a little, like you, you, you there's, a, there's actually a point at which you're like, I really don't want to eat this, but I'm supposed to, cause I'm trying to gain weight. And, and like, I, I've never enjoyed that feeling. So I just kind of, the first bulk back was this big bowl of fucking potatoes. I'm like, holy shit, bro. <laughs> like halfway through, I'm like, I need a freaking break <laughs> to get through it. Exactly. Yeah. You need like, you need, like, it's funny when you, if you want to eat it, that's why the potato diet is a thing, right? Like, cause if you, if you ate nothing but potatoes, you would lose weight because you would be sick of potatoes. So this is why you wouldn't eat. <laughs> On the other hand, if you get yourself some potatoes and some butter and some salt, you know, and you have a, a sweet drink on the side, maybe a soda. Now you can get all the calories in the world because you know, you get, you get that differentiation from going from potatoes to the sweet thing to the potatoes to the sweet thing. Right. So if you, if you were just to eat like potatoes and salt, you couldn't eat 2000 calories a day of potatoes and salt. No fucking way. You get, you get, you get yourself a milkshake in there and you get potatoes and salt. Wait, and there was a guy who did exactly that for six months, by the way, yeah. six months, 2000 calories of just potatoes a day with slight uh, allowance for some salt and some uh, spices. But six months, he did exactly that. 2000, just to prove a point. Wow. I mean, that's, some people are impressive. I guess I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't think I'd be able to do it for like three days in a row. Uh, All right. Uh, A couple of things. First off, this is show number 99. I think I mentioned that. Um, We had been uh, joking and uh, uh, casually poking Daniel for show 100 to see if uh, uh, we could commemorate show 100 by getting Phil Ivey to come on the show. Um, Is there... uh, is there something we can say today? Is there a something? Is there, we, we're only, you know, this is it, right? We got one more show to, to get there. I didn't say when we had to do the next show. That's true. Uh, during the last show, you guys asked me to infer. I text him. He said, absolutely. Whatever I need, he will come on our show. Um, I'm a little nervous personally because I'm afraid of what you guys are going to ask. him. <laughs> I'm just going to sit back here. I'm just going to, I'm going to chill. You guys are like, all Adam's going to come with the like, so when full tilt was going under and you had, <laughs> what was the case here with this cheating thing? He's like, fuck man. How about you say, how, hey Phil, how's it going? You know, That's let's funny. do some, I'm hoping that, you know, to accommodate him, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it pretty, uh, pretty light and soft. He's Canadian. You know, it's funny. Somebody was asking about full tilt and, and going back and Chris Ferguson, I think came up and I was just like, you know what? I don't even remember anything about full tilt anymore. Like, to, to go back and actually ask somebody questions, like for if we got Chris Ferguson or something like that, it would take well, me Oddly week. enough, I just did the orbit with Robbie where I did the, uh, you know, the after part uh, with uh, James Dempsey. And that's what we did is we went over because it's been 10 years. And I, I was surprised at how much I did remember. And I actually heard Mike Mattisau go throughout and he said something and I was like, thank goodness he finally agreed. He said, Daniel was telling me all this stuff, this stuff. And I said, no, you're crazy. They're not. Blah, blah, blah. And he was right about everything. Which, you know, is, and I'm like, okay, yay, finally. Like, so it is possible for Mike Mattiso to open his eyes eventually. And, and he did in this case, because like I said, you know, we, we went on the, on the podcast, talked a lot about just kind of the differences really between what Esai was doing and how he was running the company with, you know, very strong legal opinions. And then the way, you know, um, lobster eating, you know, Ray Batar was laying on a couch, just, you know, freaking making shit up as they go making it rain everywhere so yeah it was a really good way to look at sort of the distinct differences between how like a company run by businessmen versus a company run by a bunch of jackass poker players you know uh, how that well, ends yeah i'm now thinking about being in a rain shower of lobster which would be awesome but um no you know what with with phil i think I would love to ask Phil's opinion on everything. Poker honestly doesn't really even 
interest me too much about what I mean he's been asked everything with poker and and he's not a guy who loves to talk about you know strategy or anything like that he'll give you kind of <clears throat> he'll give you an answer but it'll probably be short I, it's the, it's his opinions on all, all kinds of other stuff that are that seems interesting to me yeah there, there's poker stuff I, I do want to ask him you know I think it's all, all the stuff with the intimidation you know why why he has so much intimidation at the, at the table and was that sort of a cultivated thing or is that just come by naturally and how does he use that to advantage I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there I'm sure a lot of that's in his master class too I haven't seen it but we can give him an opportunity to plug his master class too and I'm sure he'll be happy about that but but yeah I agree there's there's lots more around the enigma of, of Phil you know uh, the, the prop bets I mean you could probably talk for an hour and a half about prop bets alone and all the, all the fun things he's for done sure. with that but uh, yeah I agree there's there's so much there's so much to unpack there. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to kind of meticulously comb through this and uh, work on our work on our little document and, and figure out what we we want to get in in the, the time that we have. In. So uh, if of course if the people out there have things that they are dying to ask, the one and only Phil Ivy, uh, you can um, you know leave it a voicemail with Ross or tweet at us or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, do this down below. Hey, put it in the comments down below. No, yeah, the comments. we got to read them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, dude, let's do this. If you have a question that you want to ask Phil Ivy, and it isn't about uh, full tilt poker and who is <laughs> stealing money, uh, tweet it at me. Tweet it at uh, at a Schwartz Poker. I'm going to put the show document together, and I will include all good questions. And if we get more than um, than we can handle, then we'll, I'll whittle some of them down. But make We're it a good question. Well. Make it interesting. Hopefully, you know something that Phil wants to talk about. Tweet it at me, and I'll. Uh, we I'll got a, a fancy new layout. So above me, there's <clears> some <throat> other ways to contact us. Perfect. Yeah. Or do that. Um, I don't um, see them. <laughs> you, you, won't. you won't. You see them in the final product. Uh, oh. All right. Uh, so that's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, we'll try and nail down a date. Usually you, the four of us are just, hey, let's do a podcast tonight, but maybe we might have to schedule this one um, to talk to Phil about when he's available. Um, so uh, pumped about that one. Looking forward to it. Um, speaking of big gets in interviews, you know, we've been doing this a while, Terrence. Um, and, you know, before that, one of the biggest whales of sort of the poker world that, that never was interviewed and that you couldn't get. And I tried and I tried and I tried for years and I'm so jealous of Larry Bradley over at uh, pocket fives, but he managed to nail down Esai Scheinberg and get an interview with Esai. And it's fantastic. If you head on over to pocket fives um, and check it out, it's a great interview. It's a guy that, uh, you know, would just be amazing to sit down and talk to in two hours. I know you guys have some personal experience with, with Isai, um, but did you guys read the interview and what did you think? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, you know, to, to piggyback off what you said, I agree. It would be fantastic to have him on maybe, maybe episode 200. I don't think, I, I, I kind of don't think he'll ever do a live interview. Um, Cause I, I think the way that he, he wants to control things, he doesn't want to be surprised by stuff or, or got you or have his words misconstrued. So I think this was, always the type of interview that he was going to do. I could be wrong. We could have, we could, we could ask him. And uh, one of the reasons I'm sure he gave Lance this interview, whereas, you know, he turned down all interviews requesting the passes, of course, is the legal stuff it had not been settled for most of this time, but now recently the legal stuff has all been settled. He wants to set the record straight, but yeah, of course I read the article. Um, the second it came out, I was actually, I was actually playing poker on the internet and uh, I read it anyway. And I misclicked a whole bunch of hands because I'm not used to either playing poker on the internet and definitely not playing poker on the internet, multitasking. Still worth it. Um, read it again after I busted the tournament. And yeah, it was it was great to hear some stuff from his own words. It made me want to reach out for him. So I, I kind of I emailed the personal email I had for him. And, uh, you know, and I just said it was great that he was coming out to set the record straight about some stuff and tell his side of the story. And I think more people should know his story. And I, I mentioned to him that I thought that I'd hoped he would he would do more interviews. I didn't specifically ask him for one. I could ask I could. I'm working my way up. We're working way up to, to that. Uh, he's an intimidating guy. So, uh, but I'll, but uh, I, I did, I did say, you know, it was cool that you're going to do that because I think more people should know who you are because there is so much speculation around who you are and what you did and why you did the things that you did that I think you should get the story out. And that is what I said to him in email and he was appreciative and he thanked me. And then he just, it was like, in a very typical East Side way, he's just like, so where do you live? Like, what's, you know, do you have family? Are you married? Do you have kids? Like, he just wanted to know about uh, me and me and my like family and personal life because that's the kind of guy he is. And that comes across really well in Lance's uh, story. Did you ever tell the Victor Ramon story on here? I didn't. You guys know the Victor Ramon story? I nope. think I know. The, yeah, I, the, the, airport, the airport thing. 
Yeah. Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, um, cause he's a very unassuming man, which, you know, shows in the article and it was really nice to sort of reminisce and get, uh, you know, just some, some old thoughts. There was one specific thing and I'll get to the Victor Ramner story that like, obviously, you know, there's a lot of questions people would have. I would be curious to hear, and I can understand why this wasn't part of it. Like how he felt personally, um, with the whole S and E debacle thing, you know, mm. when, when that happened, because obviously, you know, this was his company, this was his baby. And to see him always do the right thing by the players and always stand for the employees and always take the, you know, the, the, the high road, if you will, in every possible way to see the way that that went down. I would, I would love to hear him sort of describe his emotions throughout that. Cause I can't totally. imagine it would be easy for him, right. To have to do that. But anyway, the Victor Randon story is just interesting because I, uh, apparently he was just on a plane to Isle of Man or something like that. He just landed at the airport and uh, he, Victor Ramden he ran into and Victor Ramden had a poker stars um, patch on. And so Isai did like a little undercover boss type stuff. And he's like, what's that? Right. He's like, what's that? And he's like, Oh, and Victor was like, um, Victor was like, this is a site where you can play online poker. Here's what you do. It's really great. You can play tournaments and da 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 And he didn't know. Victor did not know he was talking to the boss, right? Awesome. But he did such a great job. He did such a fantastic job that he became an ambassador for the company because these guys like, yeah, this guy, you know, he's doing a great job, which he did. So, um, but anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed the piece. Um, it was good to see he's doing well. It's funny because, you know, I, I sort of knew he was doing some stuff on chess.com and I spent most of my days there. So we're somewhat linked in that regard um, to a certain degree now. And um, yeah, no, like he seems to be doing, you know, really, really well. Um, and uh, again, I would just like, I would have, I, I guess the one piece I would love to see here, but I totally understand why it wasn't part of it was like his thoughts since, right? Just because it, I, you got, I mean, I, I got to imagine there's a lot there. There's a lot he probably wouldn't want to say too, right? Yeah. Because he was in a position where like they basically were pressured heavily to sell. Like they had virtually no choice. Uh, to keep the company the way that it was so, like he was forced to do it found a buyer and you know once you do that like once you sell you hope that the new buyers will continue the legacy the same way in which you did but there's especially new- with the employees right like especially with respect because because he's I, like really cared about his employees and it's a it's a cliche to say but like i know what i was one of them and you sort of were too as a, as a paid ambassador and he yeah, one of the took most- care of everybody really well from the bottom to the top like yeah, one of the most interesting things about the piece too is like after Black Friday, as you would understand, most people expected massive layoffs across the board, right? You just lost the biggest chunk of your business. So you're going to have to downsize. Not one person was fired. Not one person was let go. So like he really gave people a sense of assurance when the whole sky was falling for a lot of them going like, you know, for people who have children and families, like, what am I, what am I going to do next? You know, and he really did a great job of like stabilizing things and making do like, I can't imagine what industry or what business would lose instantly like half of its business and then be like eh, we're going to continue to operate as usual for the most yeah, part. we're not we're not laying any we just lost 50 percent of our business we're not laying off anybody but you're good you're okay i mean there were discussions about massaging contracts i know that because i had one yeah. right and it's understandable right like you know you know and then i know the good news is, is it's sort of a give and take relationship like i'll i guess i can share this i don't know it's a big deal but after black friday that's one of the things that happened where you know when, when i finally had a chance to talk to him it's like well you looked at my contract which was substantial, but a big part of that was, you know, my ability to play from the United States and, you know, do things like that. And obviously that was going to be hampered as well as, you know, the company took a hit. So everybody that was like a part of it felt like chipped, you know, I felt like obligated to chip in as well. Right. By the letter of the contract, there was no, I didn't need to make any adjustments to it, but it just felt like the right thing to do by all intents and purposes. You know, it's not just employees. You guys make great points. The other thing is about his customers, right? Because, you, you know, if you think of what happened after Eastside sold um, Poker Stars and, and it turned over to a company that wanted to mine the player base for everything it could. And, and Eastside could have for years and years and years gone into gambling verticals, gone into sports betting verticals and made way more money. And he just didn't. He just didn't think for, for it, it looks like he just didn't think it was. Part of it, he just liked poker. I mean, I think that's really part of it. He just liked poker. Like it, he always had. Like he. You know, you look up his end in mob, he was playing World Series in like 95 or 6 or something I like that. I played poker with him in underground clubs as a teenager in Toronto. And he yeah. was like, you know, grilling me for information and trying to get better and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, so like, he's, you, you're absolutely right about the poker thing. But also, when you think about this being a family-run business, right? They have more money than they'll ever be able to count, right? So they don't have any real reason to go, we need to get greedier and make more money. However, when a new company buys an asset 
for mm -hmm. $5 billion, right? They're not buying this asset for $5 billion to hope that it remains $5 billion. They don't make any money that way. So whenever that happens, they're going to try to increase profit. So that was like inevitable, regardless of who took over. No matter what, there was going to be an expansion when there was a sale. Because how else are they going to find a way to turn this company into a, you know, a more, more profitable? It, could, it certainly couldn't be by poker alone. Just there was not realistic especially after Black Friday. Just That's a really good point too, because Amaya is often painted as the bad guys in these situations. And, you know, for certainly the supernova elite thing was, as you say, a debacle. And, but but you, you do have to, you're absolutely right. It's a good point. They, don't buy, they didn't spend 5 million so that the thing could be worth 5 billion. They, they thought it was a good purchase specifically because they looked at this company and they said, hmm, if we tweak this button a little bit and we push this knob up and we push this knob down, we can turn this into more billions of dollars. And one of the ways is other gambling verticals. Another one that's mentioned in the Pocket Five articles was just the fact that PokerStars was not going to get licensed in New Jersey or probably Nevada. Um, I mean, they're still not licensed in Nevada. Um, after, you know, with, with um, Esai and Mark in control, so that 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 had to happen. So PokerStars was just never going to be able to maximize on what it could be because it wasn't going to get into the major United States markets at the time under under ESA's control. So when Daniel says like their their hands are sort of forced, that's you know a lot of what you're talking about. You have this thing and it's like if this thing is sold, you know, if you have something and it's worth X dollars to you, but it's worth X plus something to me, then it only makes sense for me to pay you some of that difference and try to convert that into more money. But yeah, obviously with that came cost cutting and you know you hear some employees say well it's not the company it used to be and you hear the players say it's not the company it used to be as daniel says that that stuff is inevitable it's unfortunate because we had we didn't know how good we had it um until Esai left the company and uh but we we had a good for for a solid decade there yeah you guys mentioned uh, black friday and also this was as uh, daniel mentioned earlier the 10-year anniversary of black friday um, and, you know, obviously don't really want to go through it all over again, but um, it, it, some poker Twitter stuff did get interesting. And I, I got a kick out of Jamie Kurtzetter because there was a lot of guys coming on saying, hey, or people coming on saying, oh, Black Friday was the best thing that ever happened to me or it was great. I moved on. And, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But Jamie said <laughs> she tweeted, uh, I know this is an unpopular take, but Black Friday was not the best thing that ever happened to me, which, which was pretty funny. But, you know, it's that old thing with you know, the best poker player in the room is, is wasting his time kind of thing. He could be doing so many other things. And, and that really kind of um, was the message that I got from people coming on to Twitter and saying, you know, uh, Black Friday happened. It sucked at the time, but I got to move on and I did this in my life and I did other things. Um, and some people don't want to do other things. Some people want to play poker and keep on rolling and live in the lifestyle. But, you know, other people want to move on. And, and Black Friday sort of did that, which uh, which it was just an interesting sort of dichotomy for, for people on poker Twitter there. Uh, when, when the anniversary, but yeah, going down, uh, rehash and all that kind of stuff again, kind of, uh, I mean, it's a little tone deaf, right? It's like, I mean, it is right to say like, this is a great thing for me. It's, it's like, it's, it's like me saying, you know, Oh, COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me because I got to spend so much time with my wife. I got to enjoy time at home. And those things are kind of true, but it sounds really bad to say out loud, like, well, good for you, you asshole. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like anytime someone says that, like I get they don't necessarily, you know, mean it that way, but it can easily be, you know, how the social media world works. Like everything can be, you know, taken in the worst possible light. And I think yeah. that's one where um, it's very easy to cross that threshold. Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> I, I, you know, in preparation for the show, I went and looked back at my own Twitter timeline for uh, the week of April 15, 2011, just to sort of see, get myself in that mental mindset. I looked at my timeline, I looked at Kevin Matt's timeline. It's funny, Twitter was uh, a fucking dumpster fire back then in the sense that like you couldn't see who was talking to who. You just had to like at people. Um, but I remember I, I lost it at Michael Malley. Um, I think I think, I think think he deserved it because he was basically like, in a, in a way celebrating because you guys remember, of course, Party had already exited the American market uh, prior to Black Friday after UIGEA. Um, and so I don't even, like, Michael Malley is sort of somewhat, you can tell when Michael Malley is, like, grave dancing a little bit. I mean, he's, he's not that subtle about it. And, you know, he's very, it's very clear where his, where his bias lies. And I was just like, I just laid into him. So, like, you know, fuck you, stop stomping on graves. Like, people have lost a lot of money here. 
Um, yeah, but I remember the the tone. And I know you said you want to rehash, but I just remember that weird feeling that week. I was still fresh and vocal player back then, so that's how long ago it was. Um, such a weird feeling that nobody had any idea what was going on, and we were all in the state of limbo. Like we don't know whether we're getting money, we don't want to lose all our money, whether we're ever going to play poker on the internet in any real way again if it's changed forever. We all knew it. There's a sense that in which it it was going to change forever. Uh, we just didn't know how. But yeah, like looking back on it 10 years later, it's like, you know, we survived, we made it through, but, but Jamie's point is right. A lot of people still got hurt by it. A lot of people would have made a lot more money, done a lot better uh, had Black Friday not been a thing. Yeah. So it's, I don't think it's a thing to celebrate at all. No, for sure. Uh, all right. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to quickly mention is I saw that uh, Nevada, Las Vegas specifically, is going to be open 100% capacity on June 1st, announced by the, gov- uh, the governor of, of Nevada which is awesome. Like, you know, we've been pent up for however many months now and having Las Vegas completely open and accessible to, well, those in the States anyway, uh, more for most, for the most part, to be able to go to Vegas and just let loose like that, that town is going to go ape shit bananas for like, I don't know, six months. Like it's going to be a while where it's going to be off the hook. It already is for like a lot of intensive purposes, kind of like already bursting at the seams. And I think part of the reason is, you know, Governor Sisolak did a great job of administering, you know, in a timely fashion and doing like, you know, phase work in terms of getting the vaccine out. And pretty much at this point, I mean, anybody who wanted the vaccine, there's been no reason why you can't get it. Unlike what, you know, is unfortunately going on in Canada where you guys are kind of stuck without it. But Vegas has done a great job. The issue with Vegas, of course, like anything is, you know, people travel here, you know, and, and that was always the concern about Vegas being open during the height of the pandemic, because you know, people get it in Vegas, they spread it out wherever they go, because, like, you know, it's a, it's a cesspool for that. And it's, you know, really concentrated groups of people and stuff. But it is really great to hear that by June 1st, I wonder, I, I wonder if that means anything in terms of mask mandates in the casinos, because right now there is one for the most part. But of course, if you're in a restaurant, there isn't, because how can you eat with one on? Um, the hockey games are up to, you know, I think it was 50% capacity or 20 to 50%, I don't know, but that those should be uh, released soon. So, all this marks towards, you know, like hope that the World Series of Poker in, you know, in the fall can be relatively normal. Because I like we, we talked about this in the last one. I mean, I can't imagine them, you know, feasibly putting plexiglass on freaking thousands of tables like that or, you know, having a mask mandate that's enforceable. Like people just, you know, most people I see or too many people I see wearing a mask, they wear it as a choker around their neck. Like, you know, that doesn't, that's not what we mean, right? It's supposed to go in your face, but it's like, everyone just wears it down here. I'm like, oh, I got my mask on. I'm like. Mm-hmm. But they wear the, the little two inch thing that like kind of covered, like little two inches oh. of of, uh, of plastic that covers like, <laughs> like it's, it, it, they're still getting everywhere. Yeah. Um, anyway, good signs all around. Yeah. One, one of the things about June is that June is of course, when it starts getting real hot in Vegas. So that does mean more people spending time indoors and in air conditioning. Uh, I, so I, that's my, my little concern. Like if it was actually right now and till June, that would actually feel better because now is a great time to spend time in, in Vegas. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. It's warm. It's temper. There's, you know, you can walk down the strip and, and most of the, what we know about outdoor transmission suggests that it's pretty minimal risk and that the indoor transmission is a big problem. Um, Listening to a, to, a, to a different random podcast, it was with uh, a, a lady who's like a physics PhD. And, you know, she mentioned about like, why is nobody talking about upgrading HVAC systems to deal with COVID? Um, and I thought that was a really good point. I mean, I think that there's a lot that can be done in that space with HVAC and, and circulating air through that would get things. And especially if something like the World Series of Poker, where you have lots and lots of people in a room, um, things like hockey games where you, you know, you can't have open air hockey games because ice and stuff where you can have, you know, football and uh, other sports like that outside, you know, there's, there's a lot that I hope can still be done with respect to the pandemic. Cause it's not over. Like people are, as Daniel said, almost everybody who wants to be vaccinated in the United States can, um, you know, there's obviously some groups who can't, but yeah, it's turning the corner and yeah, as much as, you know, I'm concerned, it will be, it will be a positive sign to see like the Vegas economy recovering and seeing people having fun and doing lots of things at home in the summer. Be a fun town to be in for sure. Uh, we put out the show thread today for uh, people to send in their input. One of them was uh, uh, Shruff Puff 212 said, will a massively 
above expectation World Series of Poker turnout make possible for October WSOP to be a fixture or will numbers not matter in a June 2022 uh, World Series of Poker be expected? Uh, sign someone who wants to keep the, the June uh, the June WSOP away from Vegas. Totally agree. But I think that's going to probably come down to, well, there's all kinds of things going on with this because, um, you know, the Rio, I believe, is being flagged by Hilton uh, coming up uh, next year, I want to say. So it's not going to be the Rio anymore. It's going to be the Hilton. There's a lot of speculation that the World Series of Poker will be moved to the convention center. Um, so, you know, uh, when that happens, because it's always been in, in June, because that's or June and July was because those are the dates that are available for the massive amount of people to come to the Vegas for the World Series because it's 42 degrees out. And nobody wants to go to Vegas when it's 42 degrees. So, um, you know, but what, what happens now, I would probably bet, and you guys uh, might have a better idea, but it seems like it will probably go back into the summer, especially with the boom in Vegas that's going to happen with conventions, with travel, like it's going to start ramping up again. Yeah, I would just say simply this, enjoy the one year that it's going to be acutely in the fall and that'll be it because it just doesn't make a lot of economic sense for any casino to go, oh yeah, you know, we're not busy in October, November, which is like, you know, the busiest times of year in Vegas, like, and we're totally empty and dead in June, July. Like it would just be, it would also be problematic for people because it would be way more expensive. You know, hotel rooms in Vegas during June and July, the costs are much lower. You know, you try to get a hotel room in September, October, that, you know, they're going to be double, maybe triple in some cases. So I don't expect, you know, that slot to move. It could move May, early mid-May or something, but you're not going to see a fall world series past this year. I don't think. Yeah, if anything, they're they might they might decide to do a fall series somewhere down the line. But I think the main World Series is you're going to be stuck in the oppressive uh, 115 degree heat for after this year. I feel pretty confident about that too. So speaking of the World Series of Poker, the World Series of Poker dot com dates were announced. Remember, there's two parts to the the online version of the World Series of Poker in 2022, just like there was in 2021. This is WSOP.com for. Uh, some events for uh, residents of Nevada and residents of New Jersey. And then there'll be GG Poker series as well with bracelets, WSOP. And Delaware, right? Is Delaware? I thought it was just the two states that, that are available. I, Delaware, I, mean, I could be wrong. Um, and then GG Poker for the rest of the world for uh, the balance of the online events. Um, I'm guessing there'll be an expansion this year. Uh, the they haven't been the GG Poker ones haven't been announced, but they did announce the WSOP.com uh, version schedule. And it is uh, thusly, it is July 1st to August 1st, uh, 33 events. Um, they've broken down the weeks into in labeling them. So this one, the first week is premier week. Uh, that gets things kicked off, a $500 kickoff event. Uh, Micro Madness, uh, that'll be the following week, which features four bracelet events for uh, $500 or less. One of them, I think, is three, $333 or something. So it's uh, uh, for, for low rollers to be able to go play for a bracelet. That's a good week for you. PLO week uh, would be the third week, which it's eight days, and there's only three PLO events. So I'm not sure why they call it PLO week, but all right. <laughs> and, um, and then the championship week, which will be uh, events ranging from 500 to 3,200. Um, and, uh, and so those will happen there. 33 events at WSOP.com. Um, Daniel, what is uh, your schedule going to look like? And, you know, if you have any sort of uh, hints you could drop for the GG Poker, I don't, I don't want you to get in trouble or anything, but um, what's, uh, what's it going to look like for you this year? Well, I think my July is going to be quite hectic because obviously, you know, I want to be, you know, in those online events, but it looks like I will be able, I will be multi-tabling, not multi-accounting, but multi-tabling because I expect there to be some live events that I'm going to want to be playing as well that are going to be happening. As I said, I think things are going to really pick up in the high stakes scene. A lot of people with too much money from Bitcoin. So I expect some high rollers and I expect a series likely in June or July. So, um, you know, I think like typically at the world series of poker, when you're playing a world series poker event and there's a WSOP online, you can do both at the same time. And I did that many times in my blog. I'm like running around with a laptop or whatever, because they don't have software for the PLO. So you have to bring your actual laptop. Um, but I expect to be doing some multi-tabling. Uh, hopefully that works out and uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm definitely going to be playing. I'm, I'm looking to grind. Um, I'm, I'm excited to just, I mean, I, I did, I do have a new affinity for online poker just cause I did spend the year at home, you know, and, and that's pretty much all I played in terms of poker. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I still do want to play. I, yeah, I'm excited. I'm going to be playing all of July. As far as past that, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell you nothing. I don't know. I don't know. 
Is there any other events? I don't know. Yeah. Bracelet bets? Do you make a bracelet bet yet? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm sure. I don't know. I haven't. No, been, we, I haven't we, it's interesting event. because when we talked, uh, I mean, in 2019, <laughs> we back we did this podcast that back then. It's been a while now. Um, you know, you we weren't sure whether you were going to continue to grow because you grinded so hard that you're uh, going for the player of the year and all the bracelet bets and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I imagine taking the year off essentially last year would you know now 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 you don't have that burnout. You're you're ready to go go super hard. Yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm always ready to go when the World Series comes around. Um, the thing that was difficult for 2019 was just the trip to Roswell, right? Because that was like because the schedule in Roswell was grueling. It was like it's it's I've I have a very scheduled life where I wake up at the same time, I go to bed at a reasonable hour, I eat a very steady, you know, steady. I'm like super anal about everything, right? Roswell was like a throwback to my early 20s or whatever, just a shit show. Sleep for two hours, eat whatever the hell you can, you know, don't shower, bench, you know, occasionally gain pounds of fat just like smoky environments, people kind of sick around me. It was just like grungy, you know, like old school. And I did, I will say this, as, as aggravating as some of it was, there was something oddly romantic about it for me, you know? So <laughs> my wife did not agree. She did not, she couldn't, cause my wife has hypersensitivity with smell. She smells things like I'm cooking downstairs, right? I'll, I'll be making something. She's in the bedroom. She's way on the other side of the house. And I just start cooking. I'm making like a, you know, regular food and she's like is that protein powder i smell i'm like what the fuck wow how do you smell protein powder it's powder and you can smell it up here when i'm putting it in a shake in a blender like is that real life she's like oh i hate that smell it's disgusting um, she doesn't like my protein powder smell she hates nutritional yeast smell she hates all the things right but but yeah so she did not she couldn't handle it like because the rooms were just full of smoke and i hated it too but uh you know I'm, I'm used to being a DJ, and so I, I tapped into my younger self and just went, went balls to the wall. But, yeah, I'm ready, man. I'm ready to get back out there and, you know, put my new skills to the test. Terrence, can you see a time where you, A, grind uh, online poker for day, days and days and weeks and weeks, and, or, B, go to Las Vegas and grind the live version of the World Series of Poker again? You've been, you know, sort of removed from it for a while. Uh, I mean, midlife crisis or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. Cause that's just, I think first thing that came to mind was like, Oh, if I was broken, I lost all my money. But even, I think even if I was broken, lost all my money, there might still be better ways to make money. Like I would probably get other jobs with, with people. Like I have enough hookups now that I would just get a job. Like and maybe work for a poker site. Cause, cause as Daniel can attest, like playing really high level poker now is, is hard. Like you got to study, you got to be in the lab. You got to, you got to grind those Sims all the time. You got to remember everything. And, you know, you have endless stamina. You got to have endless stamina to do all that stuff. You're against the, you know, you're against like the Landon Tysons of the world who just live and breathe this shit. Um, you know, it's, 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 it would be a hard row. Uh, so I don't know, maybe, maybe if I, if I was really, it, things would have to change in my life. You know, I have like a kid now. And so like the, the poker, I mean, poker is actually like playing poker for a living is actually pretty good if you're a parent as a job, because it allows you to be more flexible with your hours. Um, but yeah, I don't, don't happen. see it as being super likely. Don't Not see it happen. as being likely. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they put like six limit shorthanded limit hold them events back to back at the world series this year. For some reason, I, I would probably <laughs> consider that grind. Just take all the money you would spend on buy-ins and put it on Dogecoin. Or buy I, I can do that. I mean, although the best time to do that would have been like what a week ago. So. Well, it's always a week ago, but now you know it's going to the moon. Just ask uh, Elon; he'll tell you. Uh, all right. Um, well, in the meantime, when we're talking about online poker. Uh, the GG Spring Poker Festival is uh, winding down; it's in the home stretch. But the main event, Dan Negreanu, is uh, coming about very shortly. It's a fifteen hundred dollar buy-in, uh, and there's seven, I believe, day ones. Um, starting, I believe, yesterday. So it's going through next Saturday, the 24th, I believe is the final day one um, that you can play in uh, to get into your day two um, and a, a $10 million guarantee in this tournament for a $1,500 buy-in. So um, heck of a lot of money going on. Uh, how's the Spring Poker Festival? I see they've been just blowing away guarantees, Daniel. It's been crazy. Kind of what they've been doing since I've been a part of the company. And they always set guarantees that make my eyes go, are you sure? Like, are you sure you really want to throw that number out? And I know that I lost a bet to you guys, I think, by uh, suggesting that they would not reach, you know, the, the $25 million guarantee that they did. And uh, that actually ended up going into the Guinness Book of World Records, which was kind of a cool accomplishment for the company, I think. 
Um, but yeah, they, they continue to surprise with uh, throwing out these lofty goals and really quickly, you know, just rising within the industry from sort of a fledgling company that like was on the outskirts. And now all of a sudden, you know, everyone who plays online poker, not only do they know, you know, GG, they, most of them have an account and are taking part in these like massive tournaments. And I think, I mean, if I had to guess the number one reason I if I was being completely honest, it's not, I wouldn't you know, it'd be fun to just say me, but I think it's the software. I really do. I think the playing experience, like I, you know, playing on GG poker versus playing on another site for me, is night and day. Like I actually enjoy all the bells and whistles. Like I enjoy the stupid little things I can do, you know, the dun 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 that pros hate and I don't care because it's not for you. It's fun. Like the bottom line is the music, the drama, the slow roll, the river, all the stuff that 24 tabling multi-tablers wish they could turn off. Uh uh. <laughs> no way, baby. That's, that's part of the site, part of the experience. You gotta feel the pain. And they do a good job of that. And I think that's why people that's why the retention is so good, I think, because people really just have a good playing experience, win or lose. Uh, and final thing uh, before we get on to some tweets is uh, the High Six Duel. Round two with Mr. Uh, Philip Helmuth is scheduled for May 5th. Is that right, Daniel? $100,000 buy-in? Yep, we got to double up. So basically, it's funny because we were on the podcast, No Gamble Future, and Phil's like, you know, why don't we just make an agreement that, you know, this will be the last one. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't want the third one. He doesn't want it. He to do 10 of them, right? Because he's, you know, he doesn't want to do the rematch. Like, because if he loses, he can just leave and quit. For me, the duck I think I mentioned this on the last podcast. It's been difficult to try to uh, get as much action as I have in the first one because there was a couple guys that I bet with who said, like, 150? That's crazy. Of course I'm going to take Phil plus 150 because it's a, it's just not right to lay 150 in a, in a heads up sit and go. So they won and they don't want more action, which is brutal. Like, you know, hit and run me because, like, They've watched it and they didn't feel like. Uh, what price do they want on a rematch? They didn't even. They didn't even broach the subject. Wow. Was like, I don't really want to. I mean, like if you laid two to one, I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, like you already got me 150, so I want to do something similar. And I think here's the thing: it's like theoretically, after the first match, like you would should expect that my edge is smaller because I was exploiting him so drastically, right? Like I was just making some. I was making some drastic exploits that i mean i won't be able to make it quite as easily you know in the future so it should make him play better which you would think uh you know you, you should be more apt to bet on in, in the second match because all i'm doing study wise is i'm for like him is i'm literally the only study i'm doing is i'm taking a course in plant-based nutrition from cornell like that's what i've been doing with my time like i'm not studying and i'm also playing chess because i'm playing in a chess tournament right around the same time so um i'm not gonna do i'm not gonna do much study for it so uh yeah, I'm, I've, I've been trying and I have gotten some action. You know, I've gotten enough people where I feel comfortable with it, but I would be really disappointed if I were to win and then Phil doesn't want to play the third leg because it feels like round three should happen. Yeah, interesting. All right, uh, uh, let's get on some tweets, Roscoe. You're going surfing on the internet. Uh, all right, the, the first one we're going to jump to is um, a tweet that was put out by Alex Weiss. And it, Alex is a poker player. Um, from way back he I mean he was a grinder um, you know back in before multiple times supernova elite by like a yeah, lot like he was just a, a straight grinder and playing online poker and he uh, was telling everybody that would listen all poker players to get into bitcoin really early I think you know I want to say 2011 12 13 all in that range and some of the tweet I don't know if, if do you guys follow him online but some of the tweets I just wait for the tweets because they're so interesting He's, he tweeted out this week that he's taken $50 million swings three times now in his life, being recently one of them. Um, but there was also a tweet that he put out a couple of weeks ago. He was in ICU uh, with COVID and pneumonia, and he's almost on a ventilator, he said, but oxygen improved the last minute. Uh, now leverage training from bed. People ask me what causes if that causes me stress. Son, it causes me stress not to trade leverage, <laughs> which was like, dude, you're in a you're in a... I see you. Why are you taking huge swings and leverage trading on cryptocurrency? But I always wonder when people have that kind of money, when is enough enough? Like yeah. I'm really curious. Like, oh, Alex has said, Alex has said he's going to get to 1 billion and then give it away to charity. What? So he's doing it for sport then. Wow. Yeah. Like he, he, he said, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, build whatever. Since this is the tweet section, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to steal the lead first. You know, so the tweet, one of the tweets uh, that Adam referenced was, Alex Weiss saying, my name is Alex Weiss and I'm an ape. I've had $50 million downswings three times in my career. Not everyone 
can tolerate that. Everyone has a plan until they get hit. I kept the leverage on because it's about daring to dream big and standing up for something you believe in. Dan Smith uh, re- quote tweeted him and said, I used to put this guy in the, the full tilt $100 rebound. <laughs> it's like, that's an amazing story. This guy used to have not enough money to play the full tilt 100 rebound. And like now he's having $50 million swings. And he says, remember, not- the first time he learned how to play Chinese poker, I was at the Aria playing with him. We played like a 30 hour session. It was like a hundred dollars a point. He was like, we were both, we we're all, you know, that's, that's, I had to quit playing that game because it's one of those games where, you, you know, you, you, uh, you will say last round yeah. about 30 times before yeah. it actually. Because it's so easy to play the next one. Yeah, because the next the deck is already shuffled. It's yeah. right there. Go ahead and deal cards. It's, just, it's impossible to quit. And I, you know, I remember we were both joking about that because neither of us could quit. And apparently, you know, he can't quit with Bitcoin. He's going all the way. He says he's going to make it to a, a this guy who used to be put in the hundred dollar online tournament. Says he's going to make it to a billion. I don't even want to bet against him that he'll make it to a billion. And then he says he's going to give it all away. Like that's he's he's fucking it. There are not people built like him in the world. They're just yeah, yeah. He does post like screen caps of his like weekly trading summary, and it's often over a billion. It's fascinating, it's totally fascinating. fascinating. Uh, Norman Chad tweeted. Uh, he said, uh, "I love how all the big shots in poker always run for cover when I talk about inherent unfairness of reentry, particularly multiple reentry in poker. It remains a grotesque misappropriation of the game. Four entries versus one entry is." Uh, not a just competition. And, you know, while I, I agree with some of it, I think some of this is sort of disingenuous because he doesn't acknowledge the fact that people have, you know, paid four times the entry fee as the person who, who enters once. And yeah, there's, I, I get the, you know, that the best players have a, you know, multiplying their EV edge, you know, every time they enter, I understand that. But there's also people who multiple re-enter that don't have an edge, they're negative EV. And, and so they're donating more EV to that one person uh, that some people are taking away. Um, and, and while I agree on some level that, um, you know, having 10 Phil Ivies is always the thing everybody says in a tournament kind of sucks, but um, you know, it's just, it just comes off as a din- disingenuous tweet because he doesn't really discuss the entire issue. It just kind of waves off the fact that, you know, it's re-entry. And- can't imagine that was directed to me because I haven't blocked. So like, I don't see his yeah. tweet, right? So if he was, because I, I usually feel like most of his passive aggressive digs like that are usually at me, like, because they usually have been for the last couple of years. But uh, what's odd is that if I had seen them, I would have mostly, I would have agreed with his sentiment. Okay. Because I've been saying for a long time, and I got this Blake Bond guy right now on Twitter going at me for saying that I was going to not rebuy. And then I did. I said, I was considering not rebuying for a year you know, sort of you see how, you know, make a point of it or whatever. And then I realized, listen, I'm at a competitive disadvantage. Everybody else is. I've got bracelet bets, all this kind of stuff. Didn't make a lot of sense. But absolutely, I, I'm, I, for World Series of Poker events, I was at the forefront of eliminating rebuys at the World Series of Poker many years. I was, even though I was the rebuy king, I just spent 50 rebuys in a tournament and cashed from third place, right? So obviously when these tools are available to you, you use the rules the best you can to give yourself... Whatever goal it is, if it's if it's EV, then rebuying like a madman is not ideal. It doesn't increase your EV. So you were saying you were talking out of mostly from a question of uh, advantage in terms of financially, and it really isn't necessarily a, a financial advantage. It gives you a better chance of glory, of winning the tournament, of winning prestige, all those things. Where if money's not an issue for you and you care about that, the fairest competition would be one where everybody one gets one bullet. I agree with that, but there is a flip side, right? Uh, as much as I would love all tournaments to be freeze outs, these venues, online sites that break them, they're trying to increase revenue, right? So how do you tell the Bellagio who has unlimited reentry and make a killing off this massive tournament with a huge field and they make all this extra money that they wouldn't if they had a freeze out to like stop doing that for the betterment of others, right? Well, so- and, and why does Norm talk about, you know, when he talks about big shots in poker, I don't think he's talking about the tournament directors at the Bellagio or at the World Series or whatever. I think he is talking about professional poker players who, you know, guys like you who who will, you know, if you have bracelet bets, you're gonna you're gonna enter multiple times. You know, guys who are plus EV in the field and they, you know, they win the tournament on their seventh bullet. And we all talk about this and, and so like it's not on them because as you say, they're playing against they're well, playing with the too. rules of the game. It's on the if 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 you want to stop the only people that can stop re-entry tournaments in poker are the people who run poker tournaments. Here's the thing. 
there's just there are there's also very different ecosystems in the poker world, right? So if I'm sp speaking specifically about the high stakes, you know, group, which is 40 to 50 players typically, unanimously, without with one exception, Dan Shack, okay, they all want reentry. Like it's just part of the process. You buy a tournament, you bust out, you go to the cage, you know, you, you jump back in. This is kind of the culture that they want. Now, can we, as poker media and players, look at that and say this makes it less prestigious? I say yes, for sure. Because anytime someone has like five bullets in an event versus somebody who has one, you know, it sort of kind of taints the accomplishment, right? But ultimately, these are the rules that are pretty much the, the norm, pardon the pun, you know, going forward. So I don't know who he's yelling at, really, because it's not like, you know, you would have to literally, like, you can't unilaterally eliminate re-entries at this point. It's, the, it's a can of worms that's jumped out of the bag and it's become like, lucrative for guarantees for you know because venues like see here's the thing right if you own bellagio okay you you own the poker room at bellagio and you say hey listen uh you know you tell the directors like i want to run a tournament at bellagio and they're like all right well what's what's that going to do to our cash games because we have to use all the tables for our cash games right so how much revenue can you bring in okay well that's less than you bring in if you just have a cash game thing so why would we do this it's like okay well what if we tell you we can get this is our bottom line where we can get revenue that's equal or to or above, and it's a good marketing tool. Now they're like, okay, but if you can only guarantee like 100 entries versus 400 entries, you're not going to be able to run these events. So sometimes it's just born out of necessity for the organizers and the venue. But again, of course, I don't know who he thinks. I don't, I don't get like who he's disagreeing with because I think to a man, most people, pretty much everyone would say, you know, if you really wanted to have like a super high roller bowl, super prestigious event, it being uh, you know, a freeze out, which is why I pushed to have GG make their flagship event. The flagship GG Masters that sort of launched GG Poker is a freeze out, no re-entry. We also have re-entry and I think that's fair to offer both. You should always have some freeze outs and have some re-entry. So if you don't like them, you know, you, you, you play in whatever you feel is, is coming up for your bankroll, but you can't tell people, hey, listen, you guys all like playing re-entry tournaments. You shouldn't play them. We like them. You know what I mean? They like bounty hunter killers. I don't know. I don't like the bounty tournaments, whatever. A lot of people like them. When people like them, you offer them, they play them. Such is life. You know, we're having like a weird argument because, again, all we're really talking about, there's no advantage to rebuying four times financially. It's not an advantage. It's simply uh, taints the prestige if you do win on four bullets for Yeah, and it helps you win the tournament. I think the problem comes down to is framing poker, poker tournaments as a sport or as a competition versus framing them as a business. And they are more the latter than the former, especially when you're talking about the tournaments that he's talking about. Um, actually all, of them, you know, they're, they're much more with, with the possible exception of the main event of the world series of poker, because hopefully that will never be a reentry, right? It's the thing is that Norman has an interest, a vested interest in considering poker as a, a pure sport or a pure competition. Why? Because he covers it. He's been doing it. He's the, in the face of, you know, along with not a uh, of this thing for, for over 15 years. And it's in his interest to think of it as this pure game, to, to think of it like baseball. You know, you can just get all the best baseball players from this team and all the best baseball players from this team. And they're going to play seven games and whoever wins four out of those seven is the best baseball team in the world. And that works fine for baseball because the reason people, the reason why baseball makes a lot of money is because people want to watch that at the high level and they want it to be a pure, fair competition. But that's not poker. Poker is a thing that's run by casinos and that has professional poker players where the casinos are, are trying to maximize revenue, all the things that Daniel said. And the poker players are all trying to maximize their EV. If, 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 uh, you, if you have a 1.2 buy-in advantage and you bust out and the levels, you know, it's still an early level and you have a 1.16 advantage for your next buy-in, you're sure as hell going to take it. Why would you forfeit one, you know, 0.16 of the buy-in of profit? You wouldn't, you're, you'd be stupid to do so. But the thing is, I think you're, it's such a cop-out for him to say these big shot top big shot. Who, who are you talking about? Because I don't see this guy. Like who you just throw it out there in this passive aggressive general way to like, you know, you're insulting who, like, you're just, oh, I'm not saying anyone in particular, but like, then what are you saying, bro? Like, it's also the way it's worded. It's it's worded like, I love it how all of these big names don't, you know, suddenly go silent. It's like, nobody's, nobody's obligated to tell you their point of view every time you put out a tweet. Like, what are they, we're not politicians here. We're like, okay, you have your opinion. Cool. 
We don't really necessarily want to engage. We don't, if we don't disagree, we're like, okay, yeah, sure. What, what do we have to do here? Say, oh, no, 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 Norm. Whoa, I must go on a tweet storm 30 deep with you to discuss why you're wrong. No, if people, here's the thing. These big shots, they maybe go quiet. Did you ever think, knucklehead, that they might agree with you? So there's nothing to add? Start a podcast. Invite, invite poker right. pros on it. Ask them like how they Terrence feel about you guys. If Terrence tweets, he thinks, he said, if Ter- Terrence tweeted, I think water is essential for survival. I wouldn't respond to that tweet. You know why? Because I think it's true. So I'm like, what do you, do you need me to give feedback and say, well, I know what you're saying, Terrence, but I'm not so sure you're. What Daniel's f- been awfully silent about this water issue. I'm just going to say. Right? I mean, what, off- would, you, would you then tweet out, say, man, I said water's essential and all these big shots who think they know about health didn't say a word about it. It's so stupid. Yeah. I think we got our poker water gate. We're started right now. Uh, all right. Uh, the next tweet, or I think it might be the last one. So anybody who follows me on Twitter or has listened to any of these podcasts during football season knows how much I get tilted by uh, poor decision-making by head coaches in, in the National Football League because these are billion-dollar companies run by people who can't even grasp basic probability. And it's, it's almost like a, it's a sideshow now to watch these, these guys make decisions year after year after year that just they light winning percentage on fire on a daily basis. So anyways, uh, one of the football coaches is a guy named Ron Rivera. And for the the funny part is he's actually nicknamed Riverboat Ron Rivera because he's such a gambler, but he really isn't. Anyway, so he goes on Rich Eisen's show and they're talking about analytics and football. And and, uh, Ross, can you play this for me? Because I listen to this and I just- You like being on tilt? Oh, God, it's so tilting. But anyway, Ross, th- throw it up there. Because I've had situations where when we've gone for it with the analytics and it didn't happen out, and I've been told, hey, that's okay, you did what, was, what the analytics said. And to me, I struggle with that because if I did what analytics said and it says nine times out of ten you're going to complete it, there's that one time out of ten you don't. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And, 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 and so how do you know if you're going to be that one time out of 10 that, doesn't, that isn't successful? You um, know what I'm saying? I mean, if, if there, there is no guarantee, you can tell me all you want, oh, that if 99%, hey, that's good. Yeah, but what if you're that 1%? What if that one time it doesn't work? Nobody talks about that until it happens. Right. And, Just open hand, oh, put in face. Oh, like, yeah, that, was like, that was hard to watch. That kind of coach, it's like, he should, how does he have a job? It's unreal. Like, I was one of the dumbest things put together in a, in, in a string of sentences I've ever heard. Well, what about, what about, what about when it, when it doesn't? It's, I don't even have a, I don't even have a coherent comment to add to that. That was one of the most illogical, stupid, how the fuck does a team watch that? If I'm the owner of the Washington football club, and I hear the folks just say that, I'm like, oh, hold, hold the phone. You don't understand math whatsoever. Like, but you pay this guy how many million dollars? Yes, millions yeah. of dollars a year a to coach the team. He's like, well, you know what? This will work most of the time, but like, what happens when it doesn't? Well, yeah, <laughs> but when you do the other thing, you lose. Ah, oh, fuck it. I'm not going to explain it to him. But you, we all obviously agree on that. Oh, it's so hard to listen to. Like Riverboat Ron. I guess you shouldn't try field goals because occasionally they miss. You're not going to make. You're not going to make every. Yeah, field. that's the most confusing part. It's like. He's lost lots of games. Like a lot of things haven't what about worked. When you're on the twenty and it's third and one, I mean, you could fumble. You know that happens. Or you could <laughs> interception. So why don't you just kick the field goal now? Right? That's true. You're already there, you could guarantee the three points. But like you know, every no one talks about the one percent of the time when the running back fumbles the ball or he throws an interception. Nobody talks about that. They all focus on the well. Ninety nine percent of the time makes sense to go for it on third and one. But what about that one? You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm That's saying? The, I, I wish you had been hosting that interview and could ask him that. <laughs> yeah, Rich, also, Eisen, Rich Eisen agreeing with him going, yeah, what do you, I know what you're saying. I'm like, <laughs> I, well, what I gathered was, was he was, he was like, uh, what? But it also does note here. I don't know if people were reading. Uh, Rivera is eight and 18 in one score games in the last three years. Yeah. Well, wow. you wonder. Uh, all right. Yeah. That yeah. But what about the ones that he won? <laughs> Talk about the eight. Uh, all right, uh, we got a couple of voicemails, Roscoe. Okay. Email number one. Hi guys, Josh from Sacramento here. 
first, I want to thank you guys for the podcast. I know it's probably not the most lucrative use of your time, but it's really enjoyed and appreciated, and it's something I look forward to, so thanks. Um, I just uh, reread Stu Unger's biography, One of a Kind, and had forgotten that four days before Stewie died, and the last time that anyone who knew Stewie saw or spoke to him, he took a 25K stake from Billy Baxter to the Bellagio, and after losing a 5K head to freeze out to Melissa Hayden, the table turned into a 25 15 year limit game with Hayden, Eric Seidel, Ralph Perry, Daniel, and Perry Green, where Stewie lost most of the rest of the 25K. How much of this does Daniel remember, and does he have any context or details he can share from that game and or that night since he's one of the last people to see Stewie alive, let alone play poker with him? Thanks again. Oh, my God, do I have it? What a great question. That is one of our... This, is one, this, was, this was one of the most impactful uh, moments of my poker career, okay? Um, and before I get to that, uh, her, his daughter has reached out to me recently, Stephanie. I think she's going to go on some podcasts and stuff like that, and they're going to try to do sort of a, another, you know, look at his life and a you know, potential film, or I don't know what they're going to do, but uh, I'm going to contribute to whatever I can to a documentary. But anyway, so for me looks like this. Like I'm a kid who's, you know, young on the poker scene. I don't have a big bankroll. I can't play 25, 50 pot limit hold them or no limit hold them. Like, I don't, I don't have that kind of bankroll, but you know, I see, you know, Stu walk in and he's, you know, sitting in there starting the game and there's a seat open and I'm like, I got to give it a shot. You know, I got to play with this guy. Cause I, I watch. Like? Can I ask you, sorry to interrupt, but there's so many questions I have. What, yeah, what does he look like? Do you remember what so kind of he, shape? He's in? He looks similar to what he looked like, you know, in the 1997 video, you know, when he won, he was frail. It's like 80, 90 pounds, just a rack, you know, not much there. Face sunken in, nose, you know, he's wearing the glasses and whatnot. And so, um, I mean, for me, this is like, he's the guy that I kind of like looked up to, you know, that was like, a, you know, I was like, this guy's the greatest, you know? And I watched his videos and all that stuff on, you know, those old ESPN tapes and stuff. So for me, it was my opportunity to like, you know, play with the best, if you will, right? And I remember the way that which, there was also a guy named Shlomo in the game was this Israeli player who uh, he was the, you know, the weak link, if you will. But uh, I remember like uh, Stewie kept trying to bluff the guy. <laughs> the guy just would not fold. Ever. Like Stewie ran some excellent bluffs and this guy just freaking beat him in the pot with like nothing. So <laughs> yeah. So Stewie was like burning through money. Right. And then I remember he walked over to Doyle, you know, I whispered in his ear, Doyle gave him a chip, a flag or something to get back in the game. And he played a bit, a little bit longer. And wow, Stewie blew his brains out in the game. He lost in the game. It, the, the, the game, I'd never experienced playing in a game where everything about the game went through him. Everything. He was in complete control of every pot, every hand. Like he was in almost all the hands, right? And if you were going to win this pot, you're going to have to, you know, somehow get it through Stewie. Now, listen, I don't think he played well. I know Eric Seidel would be the first to point that out. He's like, you know, he played like an asshole that day. I'm like, yeah, but it didn't, for me, what I, what I got from it was this like aggressive, fearless uh, attitude that was really tough to play against, right? Like if, you know, if he ran good, Right. So he lost. He, he you know, cleans out the whole table just with, with, with the way that he, he was uh, playing. And I remember one other moment, which was and there was another I'm going to tell the whole story. We're going to just tell it here. And you guys can think I'm, you guys can not believe me. You think I'm crazy. But this this is this happened. So uh, anyway, a priest came to see him, you know, and they were talking about meeting because at this point, so he was trying to get his life back together. Right. He was trying to make a comeback. He was trying to get clean. And for those that don't know, when you're when you're doing heavy drugs and you're that frail, uh, the detox process or the withdrawal is brutal on the body, right? So that's ultimately like, you know, why he died in a hotel room was because he was withdrawing from serious drugs without being under supervision of, you know, anybody. So he's, you know, couldn't, couldn't take it. So I had, you know, I had the experience or whatever. Uh, about four or five days later, I woke up that morning from a really weird dream. I had a dream that I was in my basement back at home in Toronto and it was cold and it was dark. And my dad who'd passed away, that's where I would typically see him like in dreams, you know, all cold and frail. And um, this time it wasn't my dad. This time it was Stu Unger in this basement four or five days later. And he said to me, he said, listen, kid, don't do what I did. Fly straight. Okay. So I did not know until later the next day that he died that night. Okay. So call it a crazy coincidence, spooky dookie, whatever. I don't know. Like, I don't know, paranormal, whatever it was or some sort of thing, but like that stuck with me. And I remember I already 
decided in my career I wasn't going to be doing any drugs or playing in the pit or whatever. But it just reinforced even more for me, like, to take it seriously and to really just, like, you know, do this the right way, do Vegas the right way and not do it like he did. Because I had other examples of that, but nothing as profound as that. And obviously the experience stuck with me just playing with him. Um, I didn't really say anything to him. I was kind of shy and intimidated. I knew Melissa. You know, Melissa was like, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, yeah, you can't play in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> in my ear, right? Um, and, but I do remember just like vividly, I remember the table. I remember the hands. I remember, um, you know, just look at you, it. Did you have a hand against him? Did you play a big hand? Can, do you, can you recall I, it? Or? I really didn't because I stayed out of his way. He was like raising every pot. And I was playing, like I said, I was playing too high for my bankroll. So I was playing on the conservative side. And again, it was mostly him and Shlomo just wailing at pots, you know, going back and forth and, you know, Stewie getting the worst of it, firing these big bluffs on the river and whatnot. But I just remember the whole experience. And maybe, you know, I think Eric's probably right. Maybe for me, I sensationalized it, you know, as being bigger than it was. Because like for Eric, Eric's been around. He sees this. He's like, this is just a guy punting, right? But for me, I made it something bigger. I made it like, but for me, it was though, right? Because I watched... I, I got a sense of what it felt like to play against somebody who plays that aggressively and is good. Right. And it was hard. It was difficult. And I thought to myself, why don't you become that guy? Right. So I incorporated a much more aggressive approach to my game as a result of sitting there again, you know, and like I said, you know, he didn't play well, right. In the bigger picture, it was just a eye opening experience. And it's really, really sad. I would have loved to have seen, I believe this. I mean, Stewie had a big ego. Stewie was very confident. But I believe that if Stewie was around today, like after a bit playing a season, that he wouldn't, sh he wouldn't poo poo solvers. He wouldn't look down and he wouldn't look his down, nose down at, you know, the end of the, you know, the advanced, uh, you know, strat strategic advantages. I think he would dive in if he was clean and sober, right? Because he was, in, he was interested in finding out the mechanics of how things work, right? Like he was a gin savant, you know, he figured out poker. He just figured this stuff out. And I believe that, uh, you know, if he found an interest in that, he would, he would do that. The question is, would he get all of his other life in order and not gamble in sports and all that? Probably not, but he was always, you know, he was always talented enough to be in and he was always talented enough to be out of money. Well, he's always talented enough to be in money and sick enough to be out of money. So he had, you know, the perfect combination, but yeah, the, the, I, I don't like to tell that story too often with the, the thing with him dying because it's like, it sounds crazy even when I say it. So, but Hey, whatever, you know, it's, it's out there. Great, great question. Thanks so much, uh, Josh, I believe, Sacramento. Thank, thanks for the question. Now, uh, another one. Roscoe, we got any left? Yeah, we got one more. I don't know how we can follow that, oh. though. I'm curious, did you win in the game? Oddly enough, I don't even remember my end result. <laughs> but it yeah. wasn't a big result either way. I mean, I remember that. It was like, it was basically, like I said, I was being a nit. I was playing super tight and just watching, basically. Yeah. I bought a seat to watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Email number do. Hey guys, I just have a quick question. In 2019, the World Series of Poker Main event was almost the most entries that it had ever had, just slightly below that of 2006. So my question is, do you see the 2021 World Series of Poker Main event becoming the most entries in history, and do you see it going above 10,000? which it never has before. Thanks. I think we, we kind of did some of these predictions last week, right? I think I still have the under on the Jamie Gold year. I think it's 8,700 uh, for the Jamie Gold year. So by extension, I think I would also bet under 10,000. Um, but yeah, curious what you guys would think. I'm getting more and more coming around to the fact that it's it might just go crazy. Like, I, I don't know. There's just a lot of things are. Do you even have capacity? Right? Yeah. Like, if, if they get ten thousand people registered and they even put ten thousand in, I don't even know. If I, I got to say under because I think there's a couple factors that lead up. You know, first of all, travel. Like, you guys can't even come here if you want to, really. Yep. You know, not yet. You may hopefully, be able. To hopefully by October we would. But right. Yeah. So yeah, but that's the question. Like, how long ahead can you book? You know, you know, flights and all that stuff. But I, I definitely think there'll be a demand for people to get out the house. And there's another thing going, you know, in its direction that's positive for it is it's Bitcoin, right? Like the rise in crypto and all these other things that people are NFTs and all this freaking free weird money people are making from doing all this crazy, interesting shit. I went down the NFT rabbit hole like the other night. I was trying to explain it to Amanda and I'm like, this is insane. Right. Um, but I think that like, here's the thing with Bitcoin. Yeah. You, you typically see 
um, younger, intelligent people who probably would play anyway. So I don't know that has a major effect on like middle America. But uh, so overall, I would say the thing that will push the main event over the Jamie Gold year and keep it there for good would be some sort of widespread legalized online poker in the United States where you can qualify satellites. When you go back to the Black Friday era and, and that, like what you used to see, you guys remember the main event, you see thousands of people wearing like gear, whether it was stars or tilt or UB, like it was a sea of it. You know, there'd be like 8,000 entries and more than half of them came in from small satellites online. So that's how that event is driven to 20,000. 20, I remember Esai specifically talking about the PCA and him believing this was before Black Friday that, you know, it would reach 25,000 entries. Unique. He believed that, you know, they because they were already, you know, getting, they had events with 2,500, 2,600. And he believed it was just going to continue to grow. Um, but then, of course, Black Friday happened and that, you know, really squashed everything. Nice. Uh, all right. Is that it, Ross? I thought we had one who called us a bunch of liberals or something. We, we don't have to uh, give him his day. He's, we're not. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can edit that out there. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, this that was episode 99, episode 100, Phil Ivey, episode 101, Isai Scheinberg, episode 102, Stu Unger's daughter. We got a, we got a heck of a three. Yeah. Uh, episode 104, right. we'll answer your emails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, uh, <laughs> if you do have questions for Phil Ivey, send them in, um, and we will uh, endeavor to get Mr. Ivey to ask them. Um, uh, thanks to everybody out there for uh, listening this week and thanks to you guys for getting together uh, we'll talk to you soon